Okay, so I am going to start reading from chapter 9 called Light a Candle. Father was home, full, home for at least six months, but possibly more, as the doctors had said. By, the, by that time, the war might be over, just might, because Serbia was conquered. The huge Russian army on the run and the Holocaust that took Fran place in France, Belgium, and Italy seemed very far away from the sun-drenched farm. The children and the doctor had become great friends. First, it looked as if they would have to leave father in the hospital until mysterious items such as identification papers, leave of absence, and other tongue-twisting nonsense as far as Jancy was concerned could be arranged. But Kate showed all the signs of producing another hair-raising trumpet call. Grandmother declared that Just Came was really the finger of destiny for producing five kittens practically on the bed of a missing man, and only fools would battle against destiny. The doctor, she said, didn't look like a fool, so sur surely he could do something to let father go home. Besides, Just Came and the five little Just Came's would need a lot of milk, and was the doctor going to rob sick men of precious milk to feed it to a bunch of no-good cats? She took back the no-good at a glance from Lily. All right, child, my old ears have been deafened by the guns. I couldn't hear the weak call of a cat for a little kindness. We can thank you for the sharp ears and a pitying heart. The doctor smiled then. Thank just came. She had it all planned. Look at her. She is laughing at us, poor humans who cannot see in the dark. They stood around the large basket the nurse had found, admiring just came. She looked back at them through eyes half closed with bliss, kneading the bed of surgical dressing. Five tiny blind mites of nondescript color, swarmed around her, not at all aware of the rings of giants surrounding their nest and not giving a hoot about the wonderful part they had played in some human's life. One family of cats will never have to worry about a good home again. I can see that, chuckled the doctor. These, cried Jancy. They can have a bath in milk every day if they want to. I'd even milk a special cow for them myself. You come with me, Jancy, said the doctor. Then we'll see the little chiefs and the big chief. You can tell them about your father, the farm, the cats and everything. And maybe, just maybe, they'll let you take father home. There was more to it that, though, though. The doctor had to produce charts and x-rays to prove that father was all right. Then there was a delay until telegrams and telephone calls proved that father was really the one he said he was. Plain foolishness, thought Jancy. Couldn't they see the father, that father was all right, and, they, and did, did they think he would lie? But by next morning, everything had been arranged, even to a borrowed lieutenant's uniform for father. From corporal to lieutenant in a year. Pretty good, Lieutenant Nagy. An officer with a lot of gold braid all over him said to father and a handful of medals to catch up with you as I heard. What did you do? Father looked him straight in the eye. The muscles in his jaws were working. I don't know, sir, and I would rather not try to remember. The officer sighed. Go home, Lieutenant. Forget if you can. I wish I could. It was late evening when the wagon turned the last turn in the road before leading home. The house glowed with candlelight and father said in a husky voice, you children drive to the barn and don't you dare come to the house before I call you. Understand? Grandpa, Grandma, and I will walk in. Yes, sir. The three dogs barked like mad, suddenly stopped and whined their welcome. The children waited in the dark until the door opened and closed, and then Jancy said, clucking to the horses, he didn't want us to see them cry. I know. He knew. Didn't joy and happiness make a baby out of him in that hospital? Grigori was the first to welcome them in the barn. Blinking because he had fallen asleep in the hay, the first words he said were, no dead, dead chicken, no dead Russian. Kate, Lily, and Jancy, talking all at once, tried to tell him the great news. All he could understand for a while was the basket of cats. Ho, oh, little cat, he grinned, holding up five fingers. Mamushka cat, Grigori, little cat, Peter, Nikolai, Sergei. Listen, Grigori, Jancy tugged at him. Big boss here, big boss home, understand? Grigori's mouth fell open. Big boss home, hoo, hoo, Stana, Nikolai, Sergei, Peter, Peter, come. He bellowed and Russians swarmed in front of the dark. Jancy, say big boss home. Good? They questioned Jancy, all good? Leg, arm, head, belly, all good? Yes, yes. Me go see. Grigori lunged at the barn door, but Jancy held him back. Not now. He is in the house with mother. Oh, nodded the six Russians understandingly. Mamushka cry, big boss cry, all same. Rusko, Magrasko, sad, no cry, happy cry, all same. There was a little silence while the six Russians looked into the future and saw themselves going home. Grigori smiled at what he saw. Sure, Grigori, big man. Grigori ball like, like cow when he see Russian mamushka. Like a bull, Grigori, giggled Kate. Oh, cow, bull, big like Grigori, ball all the same. Then he winked ponderously at Kate. Chicken make much egg for Grigori. Me do all time now? All right, sighed Kate. You take care of the chickens and I'll make new shirts for all of you. Plenty pretty flower on shirt. Like Russia? Yes, yes. Only these will be Hungarian flowers on the shirts. I know, I know. She laughed when Grigori opened his mouth. All same. Rusko. Magyarsko, sure, all same, the six Russians nodded happily. 
They couldn't do enough for Father from the first night on. They welcomed him like a long-lost friend, pounding him on the back and exploring him for injuries with clumsy fingers until one of them noticed the gold star on his collar. Ho, oh, officer, Sir Guy exclaimed, and all of them stood at attention, and Father laughed. Listen, man, I am a farmer. You are farmers. We are all same, giggled Kate, but Gregory shook his head. No, all same, little devil. He big boss. He good man. Write good book. Gregory, Sergei, Nikolai, Stana, Peter, Peter. We do what big boss say. Little devil do same. Little devil grow big, fat mamushka. Little devil no do same. She be dead little devil. Gregory do. Kate laughed. I'll take the chickens away from you if you talk like that. But, but Gregory had other ideas. He put his hand to his ear and grinned at father. Big boss hear little noise. Big boss say, Gregory do chicken. Gregory do. Big boss say, Gregory jump in well. Gregory jump. Little devil make noise. Gregory no hear. And that was that. Even Jancy couldn't give them orders. You little boy now, Jancy, Sir Jay waved him aside. Go play. Big boss away. You work. He won't go away for a long time, Sir Jay, beamed Jancy. The doctor says he needs rest. After Christmas, he will have to report to the hospital, but by that time, the war will be over. Hmm, maybe, grunted Sergei, not very reassuringly. Go play, Jancy. You little boy for a little time now. So Jancy had time to take long rides to the corrals. There's a picture of him. Plan for new foals with old Arpad, tramp into the brook with the girls to pick flowers, romp with the dogs and the cats. He was a boy again, not because Sergei ordered him to be, but because a miracle had brought father home whole, unharmed, and given Jancy a little time to be what he was, a 15-year-old child. Father never spoke of the war, and soon they all learned not to ask about it, because then his face would darken as if he were in pain. Once in a while, he told small, poignant stories, but there were no cannon being belched, there were no cannon belching death or wounded screaming for mercy in the memories he shared with his family. He spoke of the small bird with the broken wing one of the men had picked up and how the little bird had become tame during the weeks its wings was healing, how they had let it go on a September morning and how it sang to them before it soared away, about lone dogs guarding ruins of houses and of cats waiting for a door to open that had no walls around it. Into the quiet pool of respite from worry dropped news from outside. Romania entering the war in August, the death of the old emperor Francis Joseph in November, as withered leaves dropped into a pond, causing hardly a ripper. ripple. Christmas came again. The kitchen door was open on Christmas Eve for the Christ child, who had already brought precious gifts. Lily's father was home on leave and brought his frail wife, wife to the farm for a few days. There was a long letter from Uncle Sandor, written in August, to be sure, but it had come the day before Christmas. There was a photograph in it of himself with a Russian family. He was standing behind a softly smiling tall girl, and underneath he had written, Sonia, she is very kind. She sends her love to the little devil, to a little devil who loves Russians. There were gifts for everyone under the tree. Grigori, Stana, Nikolai, Sergei, and the two Peters couldn't wait for Christmas Day to put on the embroidered shirts Kate and Lily had made for them. They tore out to the barn with their packages and strutted back all dressed. Then they proceeded to kiss the whole gathering, including Major Cormos and Father. Stick those shirt tails into your trousers, Grigori, laughed Kate. Those are hung Hungarian shirts. Maybe. Pants, Russian pants. No can stick shirt tail in Russian pants, Grigori protested. Father had saved one story for Christmas Eve and told it while the candles were burning on the tree. The faint sound of village church bells coming across the plains made his story of another Christmas Eve sound like a song of hope. Hope that maybe kindness and love and peace would be strong enough to stop the war soon. For the first time, he spoke of things like offensive, March, trenches, shell fire, but the dark picture these words created was only a backdrop against which the story of human souls shone all the brighter. Last Christmas Eve, he began, we had received orders to be prepared for a surprise attack against the Russians. Our trenches had been under heavy fire for days, and we had either to retreat or to advance, and those who planned the moves of war decided on in advance. We had been waiting for hours, crouching against the walls of our trenches when the word came, go. We crept out into the snow, countless silent dark shapes against the whiteness, and ran to the sunken road which lay between our lines and the mountainside where the Russian trenches were. Shells screamed overhead and burst behind us, drowning out all noise we might have made. And when we reached the road, whispered orders from the captain scurried down the line like mice. Advance along the road. Don't dare make a sound or strike a light. We tramped in knee-deep snow, skirting the friendly hillside that sheltered us from the fire, stealing toward the Russians. And then, just ahead of me, I saw a boy kneel in the snow before a wayside crucifix and light a candle. It flickered in the still air, casting a feeble light on the image of Christ above it. Oh, Lord, the man next to me sighed, reaching into his knapsack for a candle. Others had seen the glowing light, and as I looked around, I saw that more and more candles were lighted all around. A whisper spread. 
like the order from the captain from mouth to mouth, only this was not an order from the captain. Light a candle for Christmas Eve, men whispered, and their very words seemed to turn into tiny stars as dozens and dozens, then hundreds of candles came forth from the knapsacks to be lighted and stuck in the snow. The hillside now was one glow of light, and the crucifix was bright with an unearthly brightness. We were a target for the Russian guns, but we never gave it a thought. For a little while, we were lost in prayer until one of the men cried, They have stopped firing. Look. Across the valley on the hillside where the Russians were entrenched, a few small flames began to tremble and then more and more. Candles, hundreds of them, thousands, one from every gun that now was silent. Around me, men began to sing, Holy Night, Silent Night. And from across the valley, the song came back to us a thousandfold. Behind the lines, so facing each other, the guns had ceased to roar and no more shells were screaming between men and the stars. Perhaps the Christ child had walked between the lines and while he walked, peace had stayed the guns. Father had finished the story. Lily's mother held out her hand to him. Thank you, Martin. I'll never forget this night. Kate sighed a long, tremulous sigh. Oh, that was beautiful. What happened after? Father shivered as if it was the cold and rose to close the door. Only then did he answer. The candles burned down, Kate, and darkness closed in again, and let those who made the war hear the story of what happened after. Let them see. He lifted his arm and covered his eyes, but when he looked up, his face was smiling. Oh, no, this is another Christmas Eve, and the Christ child must not find hate in our hearts. Only pity for those who are responsible, for there is no man on earth wicked enough to have knowingly unleashed this power of darkness upon mankind. Knowingly, no, but it was loose, this power called the war, and while it was roaming the earth, no one could hold peace and happiness for long. It still demanded heartbreak and tears and helpless suffering from all those whose lives it couldn't take. And that's midway through chapter 9, and we will finish that on the next video.